We'll consider first uh, interim charge, uh, beverages with THC. Evaluate Texas laws and regulations concerning THC beverage manufacturing and delivery. Report on the current regula regulations and safeguards Texas may or may not have in place for drinks with any amount of THC. Recommend legislation to protect Texas consumers. We'll begin testimony on this first charge, and the chair calls Timothy Stevenson from the State Department of Health Services, uh, Lindy McGee, and Thomas Graham. Mr. Graham, are you a, are you a lawyer? Are you? A, oh, that wasn't an insult. I'm, <laughs> we have a PhD and MD, and I thought maybe a JD, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, I didn't call anybody so doctor. You say, I know you are, but what am I? Uh, that's what I was expecting. That's what I was expecting. <laughs> Thank you each for being here. Dr. Stevens, we'll, we'll start with you. Uh, introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senators. Uh, Timothy Stevenson worked with Department of State Health Services, Consumer Protection. We're uh, working with uh, oversight of the Consumable Hemp Program. I was here in May for the earlier uh, hearing and just wanted to remind the committee that uh, hemp in Texas may have up to 0 0.3 Delta 9 THC, but other tetrahydrocannabinols like Delta 8, Delta 10, THCO are allowed in the hemp product uh, with the statute and the, and the uh, litigation process that we're in right now. Uh, we are enjoined in a, in a, a uh, litigation contesting that part about the other THCs which are currently allowed under hemp. We're not allowed to enforce those right now due to the proceedings. So uh, just to uh, move on ahead to the uh, combination of hemp uh, and alcoholic beverages or other beverages. So hemp is allowed in uh, beverages uh, right now in Texas. We have a manufactured license for those. Most often it's uh, seltzers and, and uh, carbonated waters. Also juices may contain consumable hemp uh, products. Um, but at bars, there's no prohibition to uh, consumable hemp products being sold as packaged at bars. And if that were to ha happen, they would require a retail license, just as a retail store would sell consumable hemp products. If they're mixing uh, the, uh, the bar drinks with a consumable hemp product, which there's no prohibition for that, they would require a manufactured license for our hemp program looking at the overall sanitation, conveying the label and the QR code that might go to this, should go to the certificate of analysis for laboratory testing of that product. So those are the two things that really get directly to the topic today in terms of beverages and alcoholic beverages. Um, and uh, I believe my colleague uh, at Texas Alcohol and Beverage Commission also could say more about the alcoholic components. Subject to questions. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll We'll, we'll, we'll hear from each witness, and we'll probably have questions for each of you. Mr. Graham, welcome back. Uh, introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Good morning. My name is Thomas Graham. I'm the executive director of the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm very grateful to be here this morning. So, chairman, vice chair, members of the committee, thank you for having me. So, our commission, of course, regulates alcoholic beverages. And at this point, every product that gets sold in the state goes through the federal government first. And it goes to the Tax and Trade Bureau, and they do an analysis of those products and determine whether or not they can, the products used in those are legal to be sold. At this point, they're prohibiting um, CBD, THC products to be put into alcoholic beverages. So the commission has not seen any products like that approved. Uh, and doctor here can get more into some of the differences, but essentially the TTB and the FDA have worked together. and at this point they're not approving anything with that so we're not seeing any alcoholic beverages with the thc products in them now that's what we're seeing in terms of what comes through for approval and the, and the doctor touched on what could happen at let's say a bar so a bar itself in the state of texas who can mix pro, mix drinks which is what they do right they could have an alcoholic beverage and then mix something into it um, and in that case if it's a legal product that they're mixing you know, we're not going to have a position on that unless it becomes a problem with intoxication. Drugs have been in bars forever, and we look at it when our, we're charged with going into a bar, and if there are intoxicated persons there, we look at it. Is the bar encouraging that? Is the bar serving people that are intoxicated? We're not going to know whether it's 
an illegal THC product or it's you know something else. So that's kind of where we would still take action in that scenario. At an off-premise location, let's say a gas station, something along those lines, we that regulation falls under DSHS at this point. And uh, we would be there to support them. We've talked about uh, should we run into problems or we understand there's problems there, we would reach out to them and vice versa. And I think that will help in the future. And for us, again, we, we're, we're monitoring that. The doctor mentioned CBD products and seltzers, and we, we have seen those out there. But again, they haven't been mixed with alcoholic beverages and come to us for approval. So that's not something we've seen. We have been closely monitoring it. Thank you. Dr. McGee, welcome. Hi. Uh, get close to the microphone and introduce yourself. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Lindy McGee. I'm a pediatrician in Houston, Texas, and I'm here representing Texas Pediatric Society and Texas Medical Association and myself. My main concern I want to talk to you today is the effect that these products are having on children and adolescents. Um, what we are seeing in children is increased um, accidental ingestions. Um, so talking to my colleagues recently, they were telling me a story about um, a displacement during Hurricane Barrel. Someone was staying with their aunt. Um, a school-aged kid found a chocolate bar in the fridge, gave half to himself, half to his mom, both ended up super high and in the ER um, because there's no childproof uh, container or labeling for these products, same as with um, the uh, beverages. Um, what we're seeing in adolescents is really high dose products um, that increase risk of addiction, increase risk of psychosis and mental illness associated with these products. Um, when you um, give these products to someone with a developing brain, especially in adolescence, you drastically increase the likelihood that they will become addicted to these products. Yesterday, I had a 17-year-old patient in my office who had cannabis use disorder, who had tried to stop several times but was not able to, and his mother was begging us for help with it. Um, so, you know, this, this is where I'm coming from as a pediatrician. Um, when you look at um, combining it with alcohol, which you know, these gentlemen were talking about, um, we know that the, the effects are additive, um, are, are multiplied, right? You have the, the um, hindrances associated with one plus the other. Um, I gave you, I brought a sample for y'all. This is empty. Um, <laughs> it is uh, something I bought from a Texas retailer online for $35. Um, it says here on the bottle that it's four milligrams of THC is one serving, and this bottle has 101 milligrams in it. Um, this is easily, to me, packaged as something you should use as a mixer. Um, stick it in your margarita, it's agave flavored. Um, and it is Delta 9 THC, hemp derived, so legal. When we're talking about uh, regulation, um, if these products are to remain on the market at all, we really need to have a minimum age of 21. Um, to make sure that we're protecting that developing brain. Um, they need to be in child-resistant packaging. They should be appropriately labeled, and we should know what's in them. Right now, since there's no regulation, it says it's Delta 9. It says how many milligrams. There's no way for me to know that for sure. No one's checking that. Um, it should have a big label so that grandparents know that it has THC, right? Um, so, you know, you hear also stories from the ER about grandparents babysitting. They find these fruit gummies, they give them to the kids and not realizing what it is. It should be very, very clear to everyone what's in them. Um, they should be regulated so that one dose is in one package. Um, so a lot of these gummies and beverages, you know, this is 25 doses in one package. Um, and obviously the appropriate agencies such as the Department of State Health Services, Texas Alcohol Beverage Commission should have authority over these. Um, you know, we would love always research, more research into knowing uh, the effects of these products on adults and um, adolescents um, in public education. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the many senators have questions before I recognize any of them. I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Graham. Um, you were talking about, you used the term off-premise, and uh, um, I think folks in the in the alcohol regulation world know what you mean by that, but I think you said an off-premise location like a convenience store. Does that mean a place where it is legal to purchase alcohol but not to consume it? Or 
Yes. Yeah, what, tell us what that means. Is that German? Thank you for asking me that. I, I do need to be more clear on that for okay. sure. Off premise is a term in the Alcoholic Beverage Code that does mean all the locations that sell alcoholic beverages for consumption off the license premise. So the gas stations, most of the grocery stores, those types of locations, but package stores would be another example. And so in situations like that, the, the process you talked about in bars where there may be mixing of a legal alcohol containing product with an otherwise legal THC product, that wouldn't be, if that were happening in an off premise location, would that be a, a matter for TABC's concern? It would be if we found that they were having problems with intoxication in the bar. But since they're both legal products, right. if that location mixes it, 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 we would have to be looking for intoxication. But that wouldn't be happening at, an, at, a, at a location licensed only for off-premise sales, is that right? It should not be. That's absolutely correct, yes. If it were, would that be a concern for TABC? It would. It would be a concern. It would be an open container is the way we'd look at it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. The chair recognizes the dean of the Senate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. McGee, you talked about labeling, and you specifically said that it should have in big letters, so to speak, THC, so grandparents would know. Do you really think most grandparents know what THC is? Oh, sorry. I think that there should be a universal symbol, um, and that's what some st states have done, which have legalized recreational use. They have a symbol. They've decided by the state that this means that, and then education about it. So this one does have a very little down here symbol with a marijuana leaf plant. Um, but I think, yeah, it needs to be very, very clear. There needs to be education. This label means that. Exactly. And a question for all of you. Specifically, our charge relates to beverages with THC, and we're supposed to look at regulation, safeguards, and legislation. What are your recommendations for us to consider for those regulation, safeguards, and legislation? Dr. McGee? Sure. I mean, the one container should be one dose. They should be in child-resistant, child-proof packaging. Um, they should be clearly labeled. They should be tested so that you know what's in it. Um, and when I have a glass of wine, I know what's in a glass of wine. When I have a beer, I know what's in a beer. Um, you should know what's in your product that you're using. Um, they should be not be able to be in um, flavors or um, packaging that is appealing to youth. Um, those are my main, main, main points. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sir? <laughs> Mr. Graham? Thank you, Senator. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, as the Alcoholic Beverage Commission, of course, I'm hesitant sometimes to, to make any kind of recommendations, but things that have been brought to my attention that have thrown out there have been an age gate, like 21 and up, um, and a, a system that's – we've looked at other states. I know other states with cannabis, some of them regulated as a, in a three-tier system so that it's regulated from top to bottom. And I, uh, we've had some time to visit the doctor and I about this. We need to probably spend more time on it. But those are some of the things that have been brought to my attention. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Stevenson. Yes, ma'am. I concur with the doctor uh, about the, uh, uh, the dosage. Uh, there's not a unif uniformly accepted uh, dose of, or a serving size uh, for consumable hemp products or THC. Five milligrams has been used in uh, some studies. Uh, some states have implemented uh, two, as two milligrams as a serving size. So there's uh, that is a consideration in age. We've heard from our uh, consumers as well that the age restriction would be a consideration. Is there anything you are looking at in terms of rulemaking by the agency? Not at the moment, ma'am. No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dean. And before we move on, Mr. Graham. I Again, you're, you're wisely directing your testimony to us, and we know what you mean. For the benefit of those listening, you said some states regulated in the three-tier system. Tell us what that means. Similar to the alcoholic beverage uh, industry here in Texas, you would regulate the manufacturer and permit the manufacturer, permit the distributor, and permit the retailer, and then ensure that those parties don't have any overlapping ownership in between the three. And it helps ensure that it's taxed, taxes are collected through the process, um, it gives the state more ability to go in and check each piece in, of who had possession, where it's coming from, the source, um, and hopefully gets us to a position where testing could be done to ensure that if there was a milligram limit on there that it, the, and the product that was in there is actually a safe product and approved. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Perry, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Dr. Stevenson, so I want to qualify for the committee's benefit. You let off with, and I understand it's in litigation, <clears throat> but to be clear, I'm going to be very consistent, and it sounds like Polly Parrott from the last hearing. Hemp started as an agricultural bill to help farmers. Clearly, that was the intent from the federal level. Texas was looking at, okay, feds have approved 0.03%, effectively Delta 9 at the time, as a counterpart to the fiber industry as being something that people could consume, basically. Is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. From that point, and in 19, when we did hemp as a fiber bill for my agriculture industry, which has fell flat on its face because of all the other non-Delta 9 components, has tainted it, ruined it, and screwed the market up to where nobody's really growing fiber in the hemp market. It has proved to be a boondoggle for those who have invested in it because they had a legitimate desire to make fiber a big market, but it's not going to happen because of all this other stuff around it, as I said it would if we got cute. So, But you let off in your testimony, to be clear, those are currently, quote, viewed as legal, but it's in litigation as to whether or not. I can tell you as the intent and the author of that bill, it was never meant to be legal to be above 0.03. So therein lies the conversation we're having today. We've got all these chemists and we've got all these synthetic versions of Delta 9. Everything runs through Delta 9 and then it blooms into something else. So... Really, the debate of the day is how we regulate something that was never the intent of the state to have in the first place. Is that a fair statement? It's hard to get uh, into the intent of the legislature. I, I was the but, author. Uh, and the yes, intent was we were going to have an agricultural <laughs> bill that supported the federal legislation. If it were not for federal legislation, we wouldn't even be having this conversation today. That was our plain read of the statute. Okay. And so in the drafting of that, we didn't know about the flower and the sensitization into Delta 8s and 10s and all the other versions. We we had some clear readings that that was probably where it was going to come from some other places, but we didn't adopt that into the current statute. So to your point, it's challenging whether it's legal or not. It's above 0.03. It's illegal. Yes, sir. I hope the court's Delta 9 only. <laughs> Delta 9, but all these others. So. As we're having these conversations, I want to make sure we're clearly on the same page here as members. You can go to the, across the street from the Capitol here, and you can pull a sample of product, and it'll go from 0.03 all the way as high as to 40% THC content. I mean, it's all over the place. So there is no regulation of the manufacturers, and there won't be. You can't pull the genie back in the bottle to get it back this restrictive and if we do that, then you're going to have to add millions of dollars enforcement to go out and police this stuff. So the reality of really getting this back and by trying to minutia and maneuver through where we're at today, be it through liquid form and beverage or not, is not reality. So you just get rid of it. If you can't explain it, understand it, and control it, you get rid of it. And I think that's what the intent of the lieutenant governor, and I support that, based on what I said in 19. So, but I wanted the members to understand. you made it sound like this is all good. Well, it's really bad actors taking advantage of a statute that was meant to do something good. And we're, we're way past that today. So that's where I'm sitting as a member. The bill's not drafted. But to have conversations how we weed through this, no pun intended, <laughs> is is really a moot point when you have no control over the THC content, no matter what the label or age gate is. And it reminds me of the vape conversation. All these guys were talking about how good it is and it's not nicotine addictive as much as what cigarettes were. And it was really, we knew, I, I can go back to the, the, the archives and listen to those hearings. Those guys were targeting Joe Camel kids. And now we're going to call age gate it where we've already got half the kids in the population addicted to it. Genie's out of that bottle, too. So shame on the industry. That's my pitch. That's my preach. But I want the member to understand this is maybe perceived legally today because we didn't cover it in a statute. We're going to try to fix that. But don't deceive yourself. There's nothing good in this product because you can't control what's in the product. And I think Tribune or somebody did a sample across the board, pulled 10 samples, 
every one of them were busted and some were as high as 40 percent so that's where we're at that's the landscape to say that it's legal is a misnomer it was never intended to be legal and it's been exploited for nothing purely but profit and money and now we have an addiction another what what did you call it? cannabis syndrome uh, cannabis use one. disorder yeah. so there you go we're, we're, we're now we're going to pay therapists and state dollars are going to go to helping people out of the mess that unfortunately people saw to exploit and I'll just say for the benefit of those listening or watching who uh, may not have all the context um, and maybe there's people concerned about regulation or over regulation to be clear we're talking about children we're talking about children Th these products are available to children with no limitations uh, we we're relying on the good faith of the manufacturers and the retailers and that's uh, that's a sliding scale I'll just say that so uh, Senator Paxton you're recognized thank you mr. chairman and thank you all for for being here um, first of all on your note regarding the tiny print and the interaction with grandparents the older I get the more offended I am by tiny print and so, <laughs> my um, readers right here <laughs> right. so um, you had had mentioned that you purchased this online I was just curious were there any barriers or hoops for you to jump through as an adult to purchase that online? Good question. I had to click something that said I was over 21, and then it got delivered to my house when I was in clinic, so I wasn't home. My housekeeper told me she had to sign her name and her date of birth. Okay. So to order Someone it. Someone did ask her. So so to order it, it was it was simply I clicked that I was over a 21. box, which anyone could do, mm -hmm. um, and then she was not you she right. was not the purchaser right um, and I suppose anyone could sign yeah. right it would kind of be up to the I'm, I'm wondering if a kid answered the door what the deliverer I know I yeah. do there I don't know yeah I also work in the vaping world and I have an 18 year old and a 20 year old um, so I've had them answer the door <laughs> before but they're both off at college now <laughs> but when I bought vapes I've tried to do that mm -hmm. which they have been delivered to them mm -hmm. I have moles in the system too. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, thank you. And then you also um, mentioned uh, the the situation where the mother and the child both were um, very very high coming in from consuming mm -hmm. the chocolate. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned with children specifically um, the developing brain. So, you know, with, with adults, we look at these kinds of things, and, and I'm just curious from your medical um, professional opinion, we're, addictions rewire adult brains. But would you agree or disagree that with a child, they're not being rewired, they're actually being wired? 100%. So when we talk about brain development in children, we think about a blooming process and a pruning process. So those first three years of life, it's blooming. We're making tons of neural connections. That's why those first three years of life are so important. Um, then, you know, the brain continues to grow during school age. We reach adolescence and those connections are pruned down. So an adult has fewer connections than a child because you're deciding what's most important. When you introduce an addictive substance um, or an addictive activity, which we'll be talking about later, to the developing brain, you increase that risk of addiction later on. So when you talk to most adult addicts, they started using their products under the age of 21, right? So you permanently change that brain because you're affecting that pruning process. And we know there are treatments for addiction, um, but I, I can only imagine um, you know, what we do for someone who became addicted as an adult, um, it just seems it's going to have to be very different to treat a, someone who became addicted as a child because the brain is very different. It's very different. It's difficult. Um, I don't envy my psychiatry and addiction specialist colleagues um, when they have to deal with this. But if you talk to them, you know, most p adults who are addicts started when they were teenagers. That's the bottom line. Um, so their brains are rewired. Um, the, the younger uh, the, the individual when they become addicted, um, does that have an impact on the long-term effect on the person? 
The younger that you start a substance, the more likely you are to be addicted to that, become addicted to that substance. That has been shown with multiple different addictive substances. Um, as far as the complete rewiring of the brain, I don't know. Yeah. The well, exact I think answer. There are a lot of things that uh, the, the brain science, the, the neuroscience around all of this, um, there's a lot that we're learning as we go, right? A hundred percent. And you know, these products have not been studied because the way they've been classified federally. So we have very much a lack of research um, in the use of these substances. And then um, I'm, I'm thinking about the the mother and the child who both consumed half a bar of mm -hmm. the, the chocolate. Um, does the body weight of the child um, or other factors um, affect the speed of intoxication or, or the... Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So children, toddlers especially, will end up in the ICU. Um, seizures, respiratory depression, you really don't see that in adults with intoxication. Mm -hmm. um, it, from what I understand, I don't take care of adults. But um, toddlers, absolutely, my colleagues, um, you know, report case after case of ending up in the ICU. So you give the same amount, mm -hmm. a bite of chocolate, to a toddler yeah. versus a, a second grader versus a 10 or 12 year old versus, you know. Very, very different. I mean, and we dose medicines that way too, right? right? Like I give a toddler a much smaller dose of amoxicillin than I would an adult. So the body weight and then also the, the, the status of the brain development of the individual, both of those are very um, much a part of how it affects the individual. Yes, and we're so careful with what we use in children because of this, right? I don't even like using cough syrup in children um, because it can cause more respiratory depression than it does in an adult, so. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing. I'd, I'd actually love to follow up offline um, and work with you as we're exploring some things that we want to do this session on a number of of um, issues. So uh, I, I had a, another question um, for the, the two of you as well. Um, I, think, I think maybe you answered it, but my question was, how prevalent is this product in the market? And, and by the market, I mean that really in the broadest sense, like everywhere, but um, bars or retailers or off-premise or um, whatever those were. I, I feel like what I heard was that they're they're not as available as a solo prepackaged product, maybe, but possibly showing up as something that is mixed in. Yes, ma'am. Um, in a mixed drink or something like that. But anyway, you you can go broader than that. Right. Um, with our, we checked our licenses and uh, registrations. We have a, we don't have a specific field on the application that says I'm a bar, um, but uh, looking at the titles and names, we searched approximately 135 bars that also have a registration license, so they could be selling prepackaged hemp products. Approximately seven of those bars also have a, or have a man. They wouldn't need both, but they have a manufacturing license because they intend to mix consumable hemp product with the alcoholic beverage. And again, um, they may, uh, to the senator's point, in Texas they may manufacture a hemp product uh, that may have other THCs besides Delta Nine. Okay, thank you, Mr. Graham. Did you have anything to add to that? No, Senator, he has, I think, the better numbers than, than I would. I do know I see him at the gas station where my kids go and ride their bikes to. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and, and of the places that might have this available, some of them are places where a child wouldn't um, legally be allowed to enter, I suppose, right? I'm, well. How, how would you how would you address that? I, I would I would think generally speaking, a kid shouldn't be in a bar, but if a bar is not checking IDs and that sort of thing, then they might be. Um, a gas station kids are in all the time. So what's kind of the range of des describing the kind of the clientele of of these different places? There's for under the alcoholic beverage code, there's only one statute that 
or one type of permit that actually has an age gate where you can't enter without your parents, and that would be a package store, so a liquor store. Everywhere else, even a bar, um, kids can go in there freely, if, assuming that location allows it. It's their policy. Okay. So they'd be allowed to go in, but they're not to be served? Not alcohol. Okay. Not alcohol. Not alcohol. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Senator Perry, you're recognized. Yeah, and I don't know if it's Dr. McGee or Dr. Stevens can answer this. So the feds put in a 0.03%, and I would have to assume there's something that, that that's where they made a determining factor. And I guess I'm asking it this way. The reason people like the other derivatives is because the THC content is typically going to be higher, a broad range. I mean, no control, nobody's keeping up with it, nobody's monitoring it. Uh, the farmers do. If they grow a plant that's hot, they get rid of it. So so they were responsible people. But for those that are catering to this market, they don't care. And those markets are probably not anywhere in Texas. They're probably growing them somewhere else, possibly China, whoever. But my question today is, if the 0.03% was set, is that because there was some benefit from a pain relief or some intrinsic benefit to that number because here's the challenge you're going to hear it today if they're honest if you take it all back down to the 0.03 then you're going to kill this market well that tells me that either that's not the intrinsic benefit people seek from it or it takes a lot more THC to get there do you have scientific or medical data that would say 0.03 does give some relief for headaches or joints or pain or whatever that it started out? I mean, I remember a day when that was kind of the, the, the small, you know, you can sleep better if you take this, and it was, I assume, at that point, fairly low-dose stuff. But this is off the top. So which one of you want to take that may, on? May I start, and then I'll pass. So I believe the 0.3 was probably set for the crop itself. Okay. Approximately 10 to 15 percent of crops nowadays are busting the 0 0.3 in the field with Delta 9 THC. Uh, but that's also because there's the concentration of THC in the cannabis plant uh, has been increasing by selective uh, growth of the various varieties of cannabis plant. Uh, as the THC increases, so does the Delta-9 and the other uh, cannabinoids. So um, is that concentration in the plant. The, most of the plants uh, 10, 15 years ago, would you could grow those in the field. They would be the, below the 0 0.3 Delta-9 on a dry weight basis. So it was based on the agricultural part. Now, in terms of dosing and effect, again, if you take multiple... Uh, servings of a 0.3 you could add to the dose but i'll pass to the md yeah so when i'm thinking about psychoactive effects i'm really more looking at milligrams of thc not percent by weight okay. um so if i have something that is let's say we set a limit of five and i have something that's 10 milligrams of thc all that means is i add more sugar to it um, to make it less by weight right so gummies are by definition mostly sugar um, this is mostly water so it's going to be less than 0 0.3 percent by weight even though it is a milligram dose that could be potentially dangerous so and it's that dry weight versus all it's uh, that's, and that's where i think the law is is hard to to hammer down on and i'm sure there's best practices out there but so is it one milligram is where the market would say that's enough to to take care of my medical issue today if you will or is it i guess it's based on weight of the yeah. consumer and tolerance and that stuff all of those and it should we just don't have data we don't have research okay. to say this many milligrams helps with a headache this million milligrams or you know is any better than anything else on the market there like you know i don't prescribe these products because i don't see enough research to tell me that the the risks i mean the benefits outweigh the risks so it's fair to say or i'm not gonna put words in your mouth from a layman looking into it, we don't know what dose is effective, so we just take whatever dose is available until we feel like it's effective, and that may be we become intoxicated as an alcoholic would be, 
are just high and kind of oblivious to what's going on around. That pain tolerance management that people speak to, the, 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 the sleeping aids and stuff, it's going to be dependent upon that particular plant that manufacturer consumed that day, which could be from different manufacturer tomorrow, different packaging, and, and get twice the high and take the same amount. So there's just no way to control it. That's If you can't control it or explain it, then you know it goes back to my point. So thank you. Thanks. Dr. McGee, thank you for sharing this and, and your experience and, and what effects it has. I, I want to make a, a, a general comment to our, our friends from the agencies. Uh, there's always a push and pull when we're implementing legislation, and uh, normally the legislature complains when uh, an agency does more than it was supposed to do or does something that the legislature does not feel like it authorized the agency to do. Occasionally there's a problem where we don't feel like the agency is going far enough, and I know you're always trying to work with us on that balance. And so uh, with that, I want to ask on from the Alcohol and Beverage Commission, I know you described the three-tier system very well, and there's a reason we have that in the alcohol context. So I have a couple of questions about that. Uh, if products are, let's say we have a, a location, a package store that is thus regulated by the Texas Alcohol and Beverage Commission, if a package store, and by package store, I'm, we might say a liquor store, by that I mean someone, a, a store that sells uh, distilled spirits, okay, uh, do those package stores also sell non-alcohol containing beverages in, in some cases, if you know? Chairman, they, they do, yes, sir, okay. mixers and things of that nature. Okay, thank you. And does the TABC have any authority over those products, those non-alcohol-containing products that are sold in a, a, a store, an establishment that's licensed by the TABC? Unless they were deemed illegal as a drug or something like that, we would not. Um, with one exception, I would say, and that would be the way the three-tier system is set up, Members in the upper tiers can't pay retailers for shelf space like you would see in Coca-Cola and Pepsi it, it, when you go to the grocery store. They actually pay the grocery store to sell their products, and they're sold on consignment. Sometimes the, the concerns would be an upper tier member might say to a grocery store, uh, if you pay, I'll pay you, I'll, I'll give you a better price on this water that I distribute in exchange for shelf space for my alcoholic beverages. So... That would be where we might get into regulations as non-alcoholic products is if they're pushing them to benefit and mess with competition, I should say. Okay. Uh, what if what about products that are sold as alcohol substitutes? Are, are those regulated by TABC if they're sold? I think you answered my question, but if those products are, re, are marketed as alcohol substitutes, if I'm using the right term, uh, how does the TABC interact with those products and those distributors? If, if at all. We do not regulate anything over 0.05% or excuse me, under 0.05% alcohol. So the, those kind of products or even the products with no alcohol at all, we, we don't regulate them. If they're manufactured by, let's say, a large beer manufacturer, we might w regulate the advertising, but otherwise we do not, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Senator Menendez, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman, I, I've got a go meet with the librarians for a sec but i would just wanted to add this for the conversation as we move forward because i don't i don't see any invi other invited guests and chairman perry and i have been discussing this on the side i have uh, you know as you all know i i come from military city usa we got a lot of veterans and one of my uh, dear friends is a retired military officer who um you know um has some very real diagnoses I'm not going to share, but but the VA has prescribed painkillers, muscle relaxers, narcotics of other kinds. And he, like many other veterans, has told me that those legal prescription drugs are much worse for him and his family than the relief that he can get for what he has from THC products. He does not want to be in the illegal world. He doesn't want to work with illegal cannabis. So he has found that these legal Delta 8 and 9 products have actually helped him. He tells me that they, he and other veterans in San Antonio use a veteran-owned vape shop. 
So as we move forward, I just want us to be very cautious and careful in, in the fact that we could actually, if we move forward and completely prohibit these, because I believe completely in regulation, children shouldn't have access, should be 21 and over, clearly marked, all of these things we've discussed. But I think that there are law-abiding citizens and that, that we will be pushing into a market that, that, that is, is not what they want and it's not what's best for them. And, and you know, it's, it's an interesting argument because, I mean, many times we talk about, you know, just uh, other legislation that, you know, what we talk about increasing, making it harder to access, and we, we say that that's just going to be pushing people, that the, only the criminals will have access to that then. I think we don't want to criminalize law-abiding citizens by, by taking all of these options away. I agree with you, my, my colleague. This, the way this industry has come up was uh, probably not the best way. It wasn't the best way. They took advantage of a situation, and we should regulate it heavily. We should uh, clean it up, and, but I think we need to be careful as we move forward. So I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank, thank you, you Sergeant. And uh, if there are no more questions for these witnesses, thank you each for being here. Thank you. And uh, we'll open public testimony in, on this chart. And the chair calls uh, Lucas Gilkey, Andrea Spencer Salas, and Mark Bordas. And, uh, Lucas Gilkey, Andrea Spencer Salas, and Mark Bordas. Welcome to each of you. We'll begin on my right. Mr. Pull that microphone close so we can hear you and yes, introduce sir. yourself and go ahead. Thank you, committee chairman. Thank you, committee. Uh, distinguished members of the committee, Mr. Chair. My name is Lucas Gilkey. I'm a proud veteran and the CEO of Hometown Hero. Our goal has always been to provide safe, legally compliant, quality products for responsible adult use and are honored and proud to be among the founding members of the Texas Hemp Business Council an industry organization that helps advocate for modernizing Texas's robust consumer safety requirements while protecting business investment and the families of people employed by this growing industry. Some of the moderniz modernization reforms my company supported in the past and will continue to do so include age gating, child resistant packaging, setbacks for sales, education campaigns, and providing additional enforcement resources for DSHS. As a veteran and entrepreneur, choosing to enter the hemp space rather than to try to participate in the sale of federally illegal marijuana via the state program was not a difficult decision. Federal legalization, as well as Texas's initiative taking stance on regulation, made the decision even easier. Our business currently supports more than 60 families in Texas. In 2022, the Texas hemp industry had an economic impact of $8 billion on the state employing 50,000 people as well as the ancillary businesses supporting the industry, including truckers, delivery drivers, insurance brokers, landlords, payroll services, banking, packaging providers, and shipping companies. THC-infused beverages are an immensely popular addition to the hemp cannabinoid space, with a growing number of large international beer manufacturers, craft brewers, and distillers acquiring or economically partnering with hemp entrepreneurs. We too are looking at it very closely and I hope to have our own offering soon. To that end, we strongly believe and would like to see hemp-derived beverages be subject to the same testing, labeling, 0.3% THC limitations, and consumer safety requirements that currently apply to consumable hemp-derived products under DSHS. Further, we believe and would support legislatively setting a minimum age requirement for consumption and setbacks from schools as mentioned previously. At Hometown Hero, we have voluntarily instituted and adhered to age gating. And finally, having put everything into this business and growing into something we are very proud of, we respectfully urge this committee to consider that these products are considered foods, are non-alcoholic, but given the adult nature, should not be subject when sold at retail level to slotting fees. Please know that we want to collaborate with legislators in protecting small businesses and safeguard the public interest against anti-competitive forces, ensuring there are no monopolies over hemp and CBD products. Keep Texas, Texas. Keep Texas support of small business alive. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks for your testimony. We'll probably have questions after we hear from each witness. Uh, welcome. Introduce yourself and get the microphone close and go ahead. 
Good morning. Good morning, Chairman and committee members. My name is Andrea Salas Daniels, and I am here today as the VP of Corporate Affairs with Dreams Brands and also a founding board member of Texas Hemp Business Council. And our company, Dreams, is well known for our retail chain, such as CBD Pros, which operates across Texas. And we're also the manufacturer and packaging of Brio Beverages that specializes in hemp-derived THC beverages. Dreams Brands has proudly served Texas since 2018 when hemp was first legalized. We started as a small father and son business. In just six years, we've grown to be a thriving company that now employs over 100 hardworking Texans. Our dedication to the state is firm, and we choose Texas as our home because of its pro-business environment and the tremendous opportunities it provides for growth and innovation. We are here today to speak in support to common sense regulations around hemp-derived beverages. These products are to be safe for public consumption, and their continued availability brings tremendous economic benefits to Texas. Our industry generates revenue, creates jobs, and contributes to the well-being of communities across Texas. So by supporting businesses like ours, we are helping to drive economic growth and keep Texas at the forefront of innovation. At Dreams Brands, we fully recognize the need for, need for responsible regulation to ensure consumer safety. That's why we welcome age restrictions and we, res we support restricting access to hemp-derived products to individuals under the age of 21. Clear packaging guidelines, we recommend packaging that is both clear and responsible and enhance safety measures. Our priority is responsible consumer education, and we are committed to filling any gaps where consumers might otherwise turn to, to suspecting manufacturers and unregulated online resources. We love Texas and want to make it our home forever, and we believe that a well-regulated industry would benefit everyone, promoting safety and supporting economic growth and keeping Texas at the forefront. And I, too, welcome any questions, and thank you for your time. Thanks for your testimony. Mr. Borders, pull the microphone over there, introduce yourself. All righty. Go ahead. Chairman Hughes, members of the committee, my name is Mark Bordas, and I'm testifying before you this morning in my capacity as the executive director of the Texas Hemp Business Council. Texas has a long, rich tradition of being led by rational, business-friendly legislators who strike a proper balance between public and private interest. And according to a 2023 economic study, of the hemp-derived cannabinoid industry by Whitney Economics. Total Texas cannabinoid sales were estimated to be more than $8 billion in 2022. And in that same study, Texas cultivation of hemp-derived cannabinoids were estimated to be $17 billion. As the landscape for THC legislation and regulation is evolving, it's important to acknowledge the significant benefits these products provide to consumers, businesses, and local communities while thoughtfully addressing any potential concerns via regulation. THC-infused beverages offer an alternative for adults seeking benefits of THC consumption as opposed to other THC delivery means or more traditional adult beverages. The ongoing legal sale of these beverages allows for regulations and government oversight, ensuring product safety standards benefiting consumers. When sold through licensed businesses, consumers will be able to determine that the THC content is properly sourced, labeled and free of harmful additives. As every student of history knows, prohibition of alcohol was a catastrophic failure, and black market alternatives leave a wake of sickness and death. Any black market, whether it be for alcohol or THC products, imposes inherent risk to the consuming public. With the state's proper education and regulation, however, individuals can make informed adult decisions about what they consume, its dosages, and effects. In closing, the days of circling the wagons when a threat appears are long gone and unscrupulous overseas providers will fill any vacuum via e-commerce sites or simply from the back of their cars. Prohibiting THC-infused THC beverages would not only stifle legitimate and growing industry, but could also drive consumers to these illegal sources. I have attached with my testimony recommendations for regulation and have submitted for the committee's consideration. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. The chair recognizes Senator Perry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, so what I hear when I'm listening to you guys, it's not about the safety, or consistency, the the uh, 
to, for the consumer to know what they're getting. It's let's label it and say it could harm you. Let's make sure that there's a big fat marijuana sign on it so someone that thinks marijuana may be bad is not going to buy it. And let's, for conscience sake, let's just say under 21 can't have it. That's what I hear from you. But here's the question of the day. I, so I would assume that the largest percentage of your sales prior to flower and everything is Delta 8. Is that a fair assumption? Is that the bulk of your business is Delta 8 sales? Either either one of you, any of you? That's incorrect. Incorrect. So what is the bulk? Is Delta 9 your sales? Correct. So you sell Delta 9, and Delta 9 by legal had to be 0.03. Uh, it's, I believe it's 0 0.3 percent. Yeah, 0 0.3. So, so you're selling the bulk of yours is Delta 9, which is, I think, different than what I heard in May. But so you should not have a problem with effectively moving to, I don't care whether it's a derivative, a Delta 8, whatever, as long as it was 0.03 percent dry weight. It, it, you, could, you could move your entire inventory down to technically what's legal under the law today with no manipulation through synthetics that you then lose track of THC content by manufacturers and stuff. You'd have no problem with that. We're already there. You're there. So there's not a product on your shelf today that wouldn't hit that mark if for THC content. Uh, I, I'd have to go back through and look through all of our COAs, but the vast majority of our products would be fine, so, and they're, they're currently legal. Well, that's splitting hairs. Courts will decide what's ended up to cover. So do you support the banning of Delta-8? Because we, we really made the legislation around the Delta-9. We don't support the banning of any cannabinoids. So... We believe that the reasonable regulation is the path forward, and that's that's. So we what have reasonable regulations. The, the the current and, and I, I don't have a problem transferring the dry weight 0.03 conversation to a milligram, whatever that is scientifically how they derive that. I don't have a problem because I think that's where, if we leave anything intact, we need to protect the cup program because, to my senator here, there are legitimate benefits from a regulated perspective as a prescription drug being arguably we need to talk about how that access is so we need to work on that aspect of the conversation and i know we've looked at milligrams and and, and dry weights and, and those kind of conversations on how we redefine the dosage but so in one vein you say you're all legal but yet delta 8 and the derivatives thereof are the ones that have gotten us here today Correct, but they are currently legal federally and state. Well, I, I, I see where you're playing, and that's okay. You don't support banning something that is above the THC weight or the, the content, the, the percentage. The law is already set up that way, Senator. I think that we have the right to go through those retail establishments. DPS is kind of in that vein along with DHS, right? That'll be an interesting conversation to have with them. If I may, uh, Mr. Perry, and I'm sorry. Did you want to respond to Senator Perry's question? Certainly. Go ahead. And, and as a business owner, I, I really want to share that um, our priority is the education of the consumer. One of our partners is Healthway Education Systems, who put in place a priority that it should be addressing consumers' responsibility, that they have enough information. And to the point for of the uh, previous um, testaments from, uh, from the, the previous uh, guest here, is that how do you engage a consumer to be responsible in the consumption? As business owners, we are in compliance every day when it comes to what is legally available based on Texas proving to be uh, very innovative and, and responsible with having good regulation already. We are abiding in that. We are good business owners. Our customers confer, come first. The consumer protection comes first. Our children come first. Your concern is our concern. We have invested in the business of hemp in Texas that happens to have multiple hundreds of cannabinoids. So to be in a position to say, do we ban a Delta 8 or ban a Delta 9, the research truly needs to be there. And in an effort to do that, we want to be a partner with the state 
that we understand where your concerns are and be as business owners to, to fill those gaps. I thank you for that because the research to leave it on the shelf is not there. Correct? Because we heard from the lady on the end there that's a pediatrician says, I don't have the data. I don't have the numbers. I don't know what a milligram dose does versus a 1% or 3%. So to my point, you just made it for me. The data does not support what you're saying because there are people literally taking stuff off your shelves that could be as high as 40% THC content, which is higher than most pot packages that are bought off the street and getting high off of it. So the data that you speak to is two-way two two, two, two street, right? It's two-edged sword. It, it's it not is there often, to support that. It, it, it is often there. and, and Often I, there? And for the scientific research. data research are you doing? I will say this, Mr. Perry. Uh, I like that. I'm not a doctor and I don't play one on TV. <laughs> However, there is... Well, you just spoke as you... I, I do, but there, there is evidence there. Your answer very honest. There. Your honest was there's Absolute, no data to support it. Uh, I don't believe that I indicated there's, there's no data that cannabinoids, there's hundreds of cannabinoids that research has been made on, and I'm sure that amongst us we'll be happy to share the additional cannabinoid research. So if your cannabinoid research supports a certain level by milligram or by weight, that this is where bare minimum you could expect no psychotropic effects, but there are some medical effects to be gained from it, what is that number? Well, right now, as to your point, Texas is approved at a 0.3%. And as business owners, we are successfully navigating inside of what those regulations are. So if there is, in fact, evidence that a higher or a lower rate of cannabinoids would justify the wellness of consumers, then I think that as business owners, we would be happy to continue with those conversations. Boy, y'all split hair as well. You didn't say we would take the other ones that give you a higher effect off the shelves. You said we would support the conversation. See, it, you're, you think you're being cute, but everybody's getting through to it. Or at least it's clear to me. We have a medical marijuana program in Texas. Arguably, it's not as distributable and accessible as it should be and can be. We will work on that aspect because when someone takes it from that dispensary, we know it's been prescription, we know that there's a doctor oversight, and we know that the research has been done that this person can handle this much dose and have the effect sought. I don't disagree, and I'm part of the right to try guy back in the day when we said if you're terminal, you should have the right to try. So I'm not blind to you. There are certain things that are probably better than what we currently have on the table. But this idea that we can distribute as a retail facility and know that the benefit that that person's walking away from is exactly the benefit that person needed when there's absolutely no way to monitor how much that person's getting through whatever they're buying today is just false. And you can sell it and sing it all you want, but it's not true. And the bulk of the retail establishments within walking distance of this location could prove that out today if we did a mass raid on every one of them. Thank you, Sir Perry. Uh, Sir Paxton, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And is it Ms. Ellis? Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned in your testimony, I, I, I believe that um, hemp-derived products bring a tremendous amount of revenue to the state of Texas. Do you have any sense of the dollar amount? Um, I think that we, we actually have some of that. We have about an $8 billion uh, revenue that's, that was of 2022, okay. since 2020. So that's in the industry, right? Yes. Okay, but I thought that you said it brings revenue to Texas, and I, I guess I was thinking about that in terms of the impact of sales tax, et cetera. Do you have any sense of that? I, I know that we've done a, a, some, some research that you have that on yours. Okay. okay. We'd be happy to provide it yeah, to you. Yeah, absolutely. Senator, just to clarify, the $8 billion was 2022 in Texas okay. only. Okay. So and that it, would was, be, it would be the sales tax that was collected on that amount would be the sales tax collected. Okay. So that's the, the revenue to the industry. Within Texas. Within Texas. And would that be gross or net revenue? Gross. Gross revenue. Okay. Do you have any sense of what the net revenue is? Um, on the net side, 
I would say if you start, if you go down the net path and you start adding in ancillary businesses, that, that number gets pretty astronomical, astronomical. I've heard, I've heard if you add in ancillary businesses, it might be as high as $17 billion as of 2022. My understanding of net income is, it, or revenue is, it's usually less than gross. Correct. Net net would be less. I was just mentioning the ancillary businesses and okay. the total. But, of I, but I'm specifically asking, do you have any sense of net revenue? No, Senator, I don't. Okay. I don't know if anyone else had anything to add there. Did you have anybody? We'd be happy to drop off. We have a economic impact statement from the hemp industry, uh, specific to Texas as well as nationally, and we'll distribute it to each of your offices. And do you have any data around how much of the product um, ends up in the hands of children or in the mouth of children? The vast majority of retailers from what we've seen, whether it's stores or online, are actually age gating and doing it themselves. Our, our company does it. There's a lot of very easy services that you can use that, that age gate and, and make it very simple to do, even online. Okay. Um, what sort of age gating do you do online? Uh, we use a company called Blue Check. They're actually a local company, and they go through and verify age. Okay. So is it actual age verification, or is it check? Yes, ma'am. They is have to show a driver's the license. PD okay. Not what the pediatrician said, which is I checked a box that said I was over 21. No. Okay. Thank you. I, I couldn't hear you. You were talking over Senator Paxton. Let her ask the question, because I want to hear the answer as well. Yes, what sir. exactly is involved in the age gating process? She asked if it was just checking a box, and I think you said no, but what exactly is involved it's, on it's online, typically, in the online age gating process? Yes, I'll let you talk now. In the online age gating process, it, there's a variety of different ones. The one that we use does essentially a soft credit check based on the person, and if there's further clarification needed, it will force them to show a driver's license. So the first part of that looks like what? It's essentially prior, prior to forcing. It's essentially using their address and their credit card to do the age verification. Okay. All right. It has it, there's there's databases with consumer information that it can validate against, and then if it has any kind of questions or if there's anything that comes up weird, an address doesn't match, a name doesn't match, anything weird, it automatically flags it and it goes to a driver's. And level. that's what you use. Yes, ma'am. Do all of you? We, we do like use. Or do you? Even we do have online? a system in place. I, I, it's not necessarily that particular one, but we do age gate at all of our stores, and then there is again a path online for uh, verification age. Okay. And do you know, uh, or could you describe what age gating looks like at a store? So, if you are a customer that comes into our store, we ask for your identification. And we have a loyalty program. We have, um, you know, their information there from their past history of what they've purchased. So if they cannot provide, you know, uh, over 21 um, verification of their age, they are not going to be served. Mm -hmm. Is that at the at entry into the, the retail location or is it at the point of purchase? It's at the point of purchase, but we do have signs on our door, just like any um, any other store that would have, you know, ID under or over 21. All of that is posted on all of our windows and doors to our stores as you enter. And so they come in, the, the products are not openly available to the consumer. And then at their purchase, we would pull the, pull the product down and then verify <clears throat> their identification. Mm -hmm. So this is store by store. I'm speaking on for our stores right. and, and how we take care of our customers. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the Dean of the Senate is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gilkey, you said that you would support minimum age requirements and setbacks from schools. Yes, ma'am. Would you also support packaging guidelines? Yes, ma'am. We have no problem with that there. There are some basic packaging guidelines already, but they they probably do need to be a little bit more robust in full honesty. Thank you. And Ms. Daniels and Mr. Bordas, you both support age restrictions and clear packaging guidelines. Do you also support setbacks? Absolutely. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Senator Perry. We had a large tobacco suit a while back, a long time ago, because they figured out that what people were saying about cancer and nicotine was real. Maybe it's time to pursue that on a vape conversation along with the uh, hemp conversation so that the state's dollars are at least being funneled by the industry selling the, the addiction. 
And I think that's what I'm looking at. We've got millions, if not billions over time to invest in cleaning up what y'all have put out there as an industry. And, and, and the tobacco industry didn't like it, and we probably didn't mitigate any new smokers, but at least the ones that got cancer that came through our medical facilities and the addictions created by that, we had a deal. So I think some slick attorney could argue that's not cancer because I think they had a, we can't go back that road, but this is a whole different addiction, and I'm just sick of it under the name of whatever being put out there, our kids grab it, and it multiplies all the way generationally through products. And I'm done with it. So I'm hoping some smart attorney, and there's several of them out there, are looking at it going, here's our new opportunity. Because if we're gonna have to leave it, I don't hope we don't leave it, but if we do, I hope y'all have to pay for it. Thank you, Mr. Perry. I, I have some questions about litigation as well, but a couple of these, and thank you each for being here and, and for answering our questions. Uh, we want to get this right. Uh, Senator Perry had a discussion, uh, I think, with our witness from the Department of State Health Services about uh, how we measure the, the amount or the dosage, if you will. And since uh, I may be using the wrong term, but if we talk about dry weight and we talk about a percentage, there's obviously a way to make a, a, a serving size uh, very small, but pack a lot of THC into that. I want to ask you about blood orange, SSH, Delta 9, live resin gummies. It, it, did yes, I say sir. that right? Is that a product you're familiar with? Yes, sir. Is that one of yours? Yes, sir. Okay. And so uh, let's, uh, we want to get to the, to the right place, since I'm not trying to split hairs with you, but help me understand a gummy uh, give us an idea of how large, we'll talk about exact size. Give us an idea of how big that is in your hand and your finger. What would that look like? Uh, most gummies are about six grams. So what, would um, that, what? so that one, that one's probably slightly bigger. It's probably like a 10 gram gummy, something like that. So in the, in your hand, it would take up about how much space? Probably. Uh, probably slightly larger in diameter than a quarter and probably about a quarter inch thick. Okay. So in, in one of those, and laying aside the, its weight or its dry weight or its in one of those gummies. That has 25 milligrams of Delta 9 THC. Okay. And how many servings would you designate that as, that one gummy? It, it gets really hard to give a distinction on a serving per individual. And this is one of the things that we get into. It's, it's very akin to telling somebody uh, this amount of alcohol is how much alcohol you should take. Now, I'm a lightweight. If I have one shot, I'm, I'm on the floor. Now, my dad can take 14 shots, and he's fine. He's Australian, different animal. Um, so it, it's, it's very hard to give somebody, especially when you're talking about a pain threshold and a veteran that is trying to alleviate pain, it's very hard to tell them this is the exact amount you should take, and we know that. It's, it's very akin to alcohol in the sense that it's, it's not really an easy serving size to tell somebody. There's a lot of different things that, that are dependent on that serving size and that milligram content. In the case of alcohol, though, we do talk about numbers of servings, right? When alcohol is marketed and labeled... It, I, I'm, I'm not aware of, of the alcohol regulations. Okay. So... Let's think in terms of that one gummy that you described to us. Yes, Senator. How much THC? Would you say that is a lot of THC in one, if that were one serving, if that gummy were one serving, is that uh, a lot of THC? Is For the more? vast majority of our customers, I would say no. I took a 25 milligram gummy last night before bed, and I'm fine. Um, there are people that if they have never taken one of these products before, that might be a large amount to them. But there is a, there is a component of this where as people use these products, they, they become less in strength and they do tend to go up in volume. But there, there, I believe there's a lot of myths around uh, cannabis products being addictive. There's actually a lot of studies that are counterintuitive to that saying they are not addictive. Uh, Senator Perry, go ahead. I just, have more just, you go ahead. No, I, I don't want to interrupt you, no, but please, it's on the ahead. same deal. Just a, just a point of reference. Last session, we talk about changing the teacup provisions due to dosing requirements to a 10 milligram. So, so last session, we heard from medical and teacup representatives. And remind you, to your point, and to the 
witnesses point it's hard to know what that particular individual's tolerance is that's why we have a teacup program that's their responsibility to figure out what that person needs so last session we didn't get there but we talked about because the dosage required under the one percent conversation to 10 milligrams so even under the medical conversations we were having through teacup 10 was kind of the number here we are retailing it for 25, 25 going to people that literally to your point mr chairman what's enough's enough but well there's no the as this witness said she's not a doctor and she doesn't play one and that's my point if we're going to have the program it needs to be supervised with people that can diagnose and treat accordingly and we will find the right dose per person under that realm we just need to make sure it's a little bit more easily accessible and then you don't have these conversations about the general public it's people that legitimately show a medical reason to need it uh, thank you that's Mr. Perry uh, that that does make sense and thank you for your testimony each of you about age gating about uh, I think that's the term that was used and so yes sir thank you you've described what you do and in Miss house I think you said all of your stores and online yes. we get, get a little closer I'm sorry yes sir thank you very much mr. Bordas do you know if uh, all members of your organization can you certify that all members of your organization comply with those age getting procedures they described yeah absolutely that's the reason they formed in the first place they're trying to clean up their own industry and make sure that best practices are employed across the board because the industry itself uh, because becomes imperiled by bad actors and people that are selling the wrong things and perhaps aren't age gating. Uh, Senator Perry, I brought up litigation and I wanted to as well. Now there's a, uh, a role for that and it's con the Constitution gives us the right to, to do that and, and uh, that's what the courthouse is for in many ways. Uh, Ms. Cookie, are you or your organization involved in any litigation against the state over regulation of these products yes senator and so you're i don't want to i'm going to ask and you can correct me i don't want to put words in your mouth but the goal of the litigation is to be allowed to sell more potent products than the state law would have otherwise allowed is that correct no the lawsuit the lawsuit occurred because it was to protect our business and our families uh well protect your business and your families in what way well, the, the law was changed on the DSH, DSHS website, essentially outside of a legislative session, making these products theoretically illegal when the note was put on that website. So we had to sue, and that's where we were granted the injunction that has been sustained. And I think now we're going to the Supreme Court for the second time. We're in the Supreme Court for the second time. But that, the goal was not to increase the, the milligrams on the products or increase the THC. The goal was to protect the industry. Well, that, that's, a, that's a little bit circular, but protect the industry by allowing the industry to sell more products So a different it's, range of it's, products? It's my understanding if, if the lawsuit were to go away, essentially the whole industry goes away. So that lawsuit is very important to us because it protects this industry. The, there is no industry without that lawsuit. It protects the industry's right to sell more and different types of THC containing products? No, it allows the industry to actually exist and sell hemp products. Uh, Senator Perry, go ahead. I just say, and, and you can answer it, and you have your general counsel guy there, I guess, but the lawsuit's basically about banning Delta 8. Is that a fair statement? Correct, and yeah. Okay, and so back to your original testimony, the bulk of your products are Delta 9 that you sell. Correct, but that lawsuit has other implications but, outside of Delta. But really, it came up with the derivatives around the Texas law and the federal law that originated and created Delta-8 and other synthetics, where the majority in May's testimony, if we go back, Mr. Chairman, majority testified it was Delta-8 or flower, which is a whole different animal, which is probably the worst of the worst, but again, creative people doing creative things. but. So the lawsuit started with the Delta 8 conversation because that's effectively what the rules from HHSC, based on the intent of the author of that bill, that's not what we were supposed to have. So y'all sued based to, to, to prevent banning of Delta 8, which would include all those other synthetic derivatives because it gets into the chemistry of it. It, it. The way it's written, it includes everything. It includes Delta 9, it includes yeah. Delta 8, it includes everything. But, but Delta 9 is legal as long as it stays under that 
limit federally and state? One of three. Uh, I think there's some, I, I'd have to defer to my counsel on that one. There is You're some, smarter than that. I know you. You're a really sharp guy. And the way you answer your questions is really, I, I see, I, even, a, even a CPA from Lubbock, Texas can read between the lines. But the average person out there thinks it's a noble cause. Under your philosophy, if I have a business that beats kids on Thursdays, and talks to their parents on Fridays about do they need more of it and to the inch of her life, that's my business model. I should be able to sue to protect that. It doesn't it doesn't fly well. But truthfully, to Mr. Chairman's whether he admits it or not, they need to sell more potent product to keep and garner the market they have today. I, I, I'm saddened because if not for those other products, the industry would still exist, I believe, because I do believe whether it's placebo or not, in its original form, people believe there's a benefit to CBDs and derivatives and things of that nature that were very, very low. Probably not a huge effect, but people felt better. But now that we've taken it to the next level where it truly does impact how you feel, they've screwed the pooch and they got greedy. And I don't, I hope the Supreme Court's smart enough to go back and listen to testimony in 19 and all the stuff that's come about. But his question to you was, no, it's just about protecting my money, was the answer, which is a noble concept. You've got a lot invested in this, no doubt. Senator Perry, is, is it okay if I respond? You can respond. Um, you know, one thing that I urge you to consider around this is this is this is no longer sort of a young new industry. This industry has created over 50,000 jobs for Texans. And I know I know you aren't a huge fan of us and what we do, but I, I do have to give you some credit with that. You created 50,000 jobs for Texans. That's a really, really big oh, deal, no, sir. Not a proper answer at all. Do not lay that on my doorstep because I was clear in 19. If you go here, state will remove it. And I can point to the archives of testimony and people that were telling that they're not going here. And I said, if you do, there's consequences. So do not put that at the store. I did not create a single job that sells THC above the legal limits intentionally. Y'all found a way to get there. And I hope the state legislature sees the benefit of removing it. And as far as creating new jobs, we create good new jobs that are actually not harmful and addictive to people. And when we cross over and say any new job because of what it brings to the state of Texas, whether it creates a whole new addiction for us to deal with on the back end, then sad state for the state of Texas. And you can point to alcohol and all that. That's long before my history, but as my pastor used to tell me, there is no virtues in alcohol. Look no further than CPS, and probably 80 to 90 percent of the families involved in CPS are drug or alcohol addiction. So you're preaching to the wrong guy. But no, sir, I did not, and you can go to the record, I did not intentionally create pot sales, which is exactly what we've got. Thank you. Senators, any other, any other questions for these witnesses? Thank you all. Thank you. You're excused. The chair now calls Lauren Pena. Lauren Pena, come on down, have a seat. Uh, Sharon Cruck, is Ms. Cruck here? Lauren Pena, Sharon Cruck, and, uh, and we're also gonna call Betsy Jones. Betsy Jones. And those are the three remaining witnesses we have who've uh, asked to testify on this charge. And so uh, if someone else wishes to, please register outside. Otherwise, this will close testimony on this charge. Welcome. We'll start over here on my right and uh, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Hi, uh, my name is Lauren Pena. Um, I have PTSD uh, because of childhood trauma. And I do have to say that when I was in my youth, I did recreationally use marijuana. Um, the marijuana back then is not the same marijuana as it is today. It is so much more potent. And when it comes to the Delta 8 and all of these products, I can tell you I have recently tried them. And not only does it make my PTSD worse, it also causes me to get angry. And the thing that I'm concerned with with that is I know I was here just a couple days ago testifying about my neighborhood and how homelessness and drug addiction is deeply affecting it. 
in my neighborhood alone, within a five block radius, there are seven stores that sell these products. It's detrimental to the community. So as a mother of four, someone with PTSD, and someone who has, uh, I guess, used these products, I don't recommend them for the public. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Introduce yourself. Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Sharon Crook. I'm a constituent in Senator Robert Nichols' district. I'm the executive director of a community coalition in East Texas that's focused on preventing youth substance misuse. The biggest responsibility of my organization is to protect our youth from harmful substances, and intoxicating cannabis products are harmful to youth, so it's my duty to speak up. Since 2019, the availability of intoxicating cannabis products have exploded across Texas. Nearly every convenience store has entire shelves divided, devoted to these products. And now, in addition to all the e-cigarette variations, we are faced with the newest product designed to attract youth, THC infused drinks. Companies such as Sparkling Dope, Tejas Tonic and Chill State are steadily pumping out these drinks with flavors like Blackberry Lemon Good Time Seltzer and Chill State Pineapple Express Sparkling Water. A quick look at these companies' websites finds the following quotes, all natural, fast acting, and it gets you high. Rest assured, these harmful products are not limited to urban areas like Houston or Austin. The market is quickly expanding into rural parts of the state. Chairman Hughes, you might be surprised to know that Tejas Tonic is being sold at a Tyler convenience store. And Chill State can be found in Longview at an established establishment that's deemed uh, for on-premise consumption. Who regulates these products? TABC has no authority over them and we don't have an age limit. THC infused drinks can easily be ordered online and can be found in convenience stores next to the seltzer waters and the sodas that are popular with youth. And packaging makes it difficult, as the doctor said, to tell that you're purchasing a cannabis infused product. We can all agree that we wanna protect Texas youth and the research is clear. When a product is readily available and kids are exposed to it, their perception of harm decreases. So we are implicitly telling our youth that using THC is permissive and encouraged. A ban is not going to fix the problem. I mean, a ban is going to fix the problem. Any kind of regulation just allows for companies to find the loopholes that then they can exploit for the money that they're interested in. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome. Pull that microphone close and introduce yourself yes, and give us your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Betsy Jones, and I'm the Director of Policy and Strategy at Texans for Safe and Drug-Free Youth. I'm also an attorney. I don't think I'm a slick one, Senator Perry, but um, I live in San Antonio in District 26, and I'm here today in support of banning all intoxicating cannabis, cannabis, cannabis products, including the beverages from Texas Marketplace. Um, Senator Perry, I don't have this in my two-minute remarks, but I do know a little of the history of the 0.3% THC requirement, um, so we can talk about that later. Um, so research shows that when you increase youth access to a product, they do use more. Uh, Dr. McGee already explained why it's so important to keep these products away from youth, and a ban is the best way to do that. I've included some images in the blue folders that show products available in Texas stores at this time. The Texas retailers are carrying beverages in cans and bottles with THC in chilled, ready-to-drink uh, displays within reach of customers. What's also alarming is that restaurants and bars are selling cannabinoid beverages side-by-side -side or mixed with alcohol, despite evidence showing that alcohol and THC each interact to enhance the impairing effects of the other. Texas data shows that alcohol is the number one drug involved in impaired driving crashes, but number two is alcohol combined with cannabis. Alcohol plus cannabis is the most common combination of drugs involved in fatalities and serious injury crashes. Youth are at especially high risk with 26% of fatalities among those 25 and younger testing positive for drug and alcohol use. In Basile's polls of voting Texans, data shows that the voting public overwhelmingly supports cannabis regulations, including a ban, which would, would protect our youth especially. It's up to you as the decision makers to put public health and safety ahead of business interests. Research supports a ban on derived intoxicating cannabis products. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Perry, you're recognized. Yeah, I, I, I... I don't want to top the committee's time a lot, but I think it is interesting. Do you have a short synopsis of how they came up with the 
Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, intoxication or um, safety or health. It's, it's a legal, like a, a law enforcement designation that was designed to separate hemp and marijuana so they could decide which was which was safer and which should great be great information enforced. and i mm -hmm. think that mr chairman that point it goes to the further the reason a ban is required is because we have put our law enforcement in a very untenable case because when they stop they can't tell the distinction between hemp or marijuana so considering the backlog at the courts in the in the da's across the state and what they're dealing with it becomes a non report or you know they can't pursue it so if you if you can't regulate it control it and enforce it you just don't allow it to happen that way anytime you come across to it you don't have to question it's illegal it doesn't matter whether it's hemp or not it's it's illegal right if we ban it so we really do our law enforcement a huge favor to fix this problem with clarity and no opportunity for loopholes Thank you, Senator. Uh, any other questions yeah. for these witnesses? Thank you for being here. Thank you. That's all the testimony we have on the uh, discharge. I thank each of our witnesses.